Good morning, brothers and sisters, and a special welcome and greeting to you know, all guests and visitors worshiping with us this Lord's Day. The Council has only one following announcement, that our offerings today are for the work of Middle East Reformed Fellowship. So far, the announcements let us lift up our hearts to the Lord in worship. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? now the Lord's greeting. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us praise our God together by singing from Psalm 31 stanzas 1 and 2. Let us now listen to the law of our God who has given us his law and the Ten Commandments, the revelation of his perfect and holy character and holy nature, and he has called us to reflect his holiness and righteousness also by keeping the law, which we can only do out of thankfulness to God for his mercy shown to us in the person and work of Christ. So let us hear God's law and respond to it thereafter by singing from Psalm 5, stanzas 1, and four, 1 through 4. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Lord Jesus Christ also perfectly summarized God's law when he taught us the following summary of the law, saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now humble ourselves before God in prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we come before you this morning to worship you and to confess that it is only in you that we live and move and have our being. Only in you do we find our source for life and every blessing. We acknowledge that our help is found only in you and nowhere else. We depend upon your mercy and grace and peace to supply us our every need, physical and spiritual, for nothing can give strength to our hearts, nothing can satisfy the deepest longings that we have apart from you. Father, your covenant of grace, your relationship of mercy with us 
is a great and precious gift. We thank and praise you for it. We confess that it was your work which established the covenant, not ours. We confess that we have only broken your covenant in so many ways through our sin, through our disobedience, through foolishness and rebellion. Even looking back on the past week, we know that we did not serve you with the zeal that you require. We gave our hearts to other things, to idols of our own making, and to the deceitful lies of the evil one. Daily we are reminded of our shortcomings, and we experience constant frustration for failing to live up to your holy standard given us in your law. So Lord, we turn to you again for grace. Graciously forgive our sins through the blood of your Son and take away the things that stand in the way between us and you. Look upon us in your grace and mercy. Look upon us in the same way as you look upon your Son. Jesus Christ. And Father, graciously restore our confidence and our trust and our assurance wherever they may be lacking. Build us up in the one true faith so that we may not waver with doubt or uncertainty, but that we may find our strength and stability in you. And so, Father, speak to us graciously again this morning through your word. May your word be accepted by each of us personally and powerfully through the inner working of your spirit. Father, cause your word to accomplish what you have set out for it to accomplish, that it may not return to you empty, but that it may return to you full, full of the fruit of faith and the glory of kingdom living. Father, also bless us through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper this morning that our faith and our trust may be strengthened as we partake of this holy meal in remembrance of what Christ has done for us and in fellowship with our Lord and Savior and with one another. So, Father, we pray that your good purposes may be accomplished in our midst, in our hearts, in our lives this morning and that we may find everything we need in you for today and for every day. We pray this all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us together join our hearts in song by singing from Psalm 25, stanzas 8 and 9.
I invite you now to turn with me in God's Word and Holy Scripture to the book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations found in the Old Testament following the book of Jeremiah. Lamentations often attributed to Jeremiah as being the author. And the book of Lamentations was, was uh, written at the time of the exile into Babylon where the Israelites were removed from their land. The glory was removed from Israel. And this book is written to express the sorrow that was experienced on the part of the Israelites. So let us read together from Lamentations chapter 1. We'll read the first 11 verses. Lamentations chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, hear the word of God. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night, tears are upon her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no, none to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn. For no one comes to her appointed feast. All her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan. Her maidens grieve. And she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. All the splendor has departed from the daughter of Zion. Her princes are like deer that find no pasture. In weakness they have fled before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. Jerusalem has sinned greatly and so has become unclean. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness and she herself groans and turns away. Her filthiness clung to her skirts. She did not consider her future. Her fall was astounding. There was none to comfort her. Look, O Lord, on my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary, those you had forbidden to enter her assembly. All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food to keep themselves alive. Look, O Lord. And consider, for I am despised. So far, our reading from Lamentations. Let us turn now to our text, which we find in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. In particular, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. The second beatitude of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. 5 verse 4 being our text this morning. Our text reads as follows, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So far, our text. After the proclamation of God's word, let us respond in song by singing from Psalm 42, stanzas 2 and 3. Psalm 42, stanzas 2 and 3, following the sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, 
the beatitude before us this morning probably strikes many of us as somewhat odd, somewhat strange, perplexing, confusing. Blessed and mourn don't seem to go together. We naturally tend to think that this life has enough sorrow and misery on its own already, so why does Christ, as it were, throw a, a wet blanket op- over us by, by pronouncing a blessing for those who mourn? This seems just so counterintuitive, so countercultural. What Christ is saying here in our text is a message that you would never hear this world say. The world we live in is, is, practically speaking, allergic to mourning. They would rather ignore it, rather be distracted from it. The beatitude of the world, if the world were to compose a set of beatitudes, their beatitude would be something like this. Blessed are the comedians, the ones who can be light-hearted and jovial, so that through their humor they can bring a smile to people's faces and make them feel better. Laughter is the best medicine, isn't it? So what's the idea that Christ wants to teach us in the second beatitude? We'll consider the meaning of Christ's preaching and teaching in our text this morning under this theme, Blessed are those who mourn. We'll see first the blessed, looking at who they are, And secondly, the blessing, looking at what they receive and experience. First of all, who did Christ have in mind here when he spoke these words? To answer that question, we must first take note of the context in which Christ lived, as well as the context in which Matthew composed the words that we read this morning. In both cases, they were addressing a Jewish audience, not a Canadian 21st century one. And this is important to remember because each of our situations of mourning differ from one another. There, There may be a different reason for each of us to mourn, such as having lost a loved one, near and dear to us, a husband, a wife, a child, a parent, a niece, a nephew. And God certainly cares a great deal for us in our grief and in our sorrow. And and this passage can be extended also to include those things, but that's not first and foremost what this text, what this passage is about. We don't comfort someone who is in grief over the death of a loved one and and we say to them, what a blessing, isn't it? That the life that was once so vibrant and alive has now been snuffed out. What was woven together so intricately and and wonderfully made is is now separated between body and, and soul. We don't say that. And so we have to be clear as to who Christ meant here by those who mourn and not immediately fill it and load it with our own meaning. And what we discover then is that this passage was spoken to and written for a people who were awaiting the kingdom of God. For you must understand, for every Jewish person, the coming of the kingdom as it should also be for us, was always something on their radar. Think of the religiously devout man, Simeon, a good example of this. Luke tells us that he was a man who was longing for the promises of God to come true so that the glory of God would again be seen in Israel. And when he sees the the child, Christ, brought to the temple by his parents, Simeon knows instantly, he knows instantly through the insight that God gives him that this particular child in him was the salvation of Israel. 
Anna the prophetess as well. We are told, worshipped in the temple day and night, fasting, praying, looking forward to the redemption of Israel. She too saw this child, saw in him the hope that she had been longing for. Now these weren't crazy people, at least Scripture never portrays them that way. But there was a certain seriousness about them. They longed for God's people and God's plan to flourish, His cause to succeed, His promises to come true and be fulfilled in, in full so that God's people would be a light to the nations, which would be realized when the Messiah, who was promised, would come and usher in a, a new regime, a new order of things. A world where things would not be the same as they currently were. This is basically the same longing that Simeon and Anna had, which was foreshadowed by the book of Lamentations, which shows us Israel's great national spiritual tragedy. Israel's story was not just the story of a political crisis, it was not just a situation where Israel was the little kingdom, the little guy, that could not prevail over the, the bigger, more powerful nations surrounding her. And, and as one empire turned over to another empire, Israel just got caught up in the mix. That representation, that portrayal, might be how an unbelieving historian looks at Israel's history and Israel's situation. But if you look at things how the Bible portrays them and how God views the big picture of Israel's tragedy, what we see is that God is teaching us about the way of unfaithfulness and the bitter fruit that, that it produces. God is teaching us through Israel about sin's consequences, the punishments that our sins will, will bring upon us. And so the book of Lamentations, not surprisingly, is a book full of, as its name suggests, laments. It's written in, in sorrowful pleading to the Lord to say, Lord, we're a wreck. Your people are in distress starving, beaten up, raped and abused and left for dead. The able-bodied have been taken away into exile. The leaders are gone. The enemies still continue to oppress us and, and they laugh at our misery. It was one big, sad story. Was that just the situation back then? Though this was perhaps the, the lowest of the lows, as time went on, the situation did not really improve all that much. Life in Israel was never as it once was, formerly. Oppression just changed administrators. From the Babylonians to the Persians, from the Persians to the Greeks, to the Romans. But all the while, at the heart of the sorrow of the Israelites, at the heart of their concern, was the fact that the kingdom of God, that the kingdom He had promised, had not come. The cause of the Lord was not succeeding. It was not obvious to be seen. But the people were flattened and bruised and beaten down. This was their misery. Despite all the other miserable, all the miserable conditions that they experienced, this was at the center of their mourning. And so they lived in deep longing for the kingdom to come, for healing to prevail, for what was fractured and broken apart and not functioning to flourish again. And to flourish even better than it did before. Well, brothers and sisters, is this not what we want to see too? To see the divisions 
in the church be healed? The church divided between East and West? The church divided between Roman Catholic and Protestant? All the divisions between Protestants themselves? But below all of that is, is the sin that, that exists deep inside our own hearts. We have the, the table of, of communion of Christ set before us. Don't we all need it? The suffering, the cross, the grace, the mercy of God to remove the wrath of God, we all need that still, don't we? There's a mourning, that, there's a lament that we as believers have that causes an ache in our souls. And that ache cannot be removed by simply putting on a happy face and, and being positive, though we should try. This ache arises in our hearts when we understand how sin has so many people in its clutches, destroying people, deceiving people, leading them astray. Are we grieved by that? Or is it just something that we, we shrug off as, as simply people getting what they deserve? Does your heart ever lament, Lord, let your kingdom come. We are so far off from the way that it is supposed to be. We all have bumps and bruises, scrapes and scratches and scars. What elder... What office bearer, what minister cannot testify to the sins of his youth? Shame over the blunders of the past and even of the present in trying to serve the church. What parent has not made mistakes or suffered from the mistakes made by their parents? When we look at the world, when we see the brokenness, the fractures, so many people living estranged and separated from Christ, not knowing or believing in the power of the cross for forgiveness and for new life. And there are all the people duped by false religion, all the people deceived by no religion, or so they think, all the people wallowing in their sin, trapped by by narcissism and, and infatuation with themselves or, or with the pursuit of, of fleeting pleasures, whether it be through alcohol, through drugs, through gambling, through affairs, or whatever. We see it in Christian people too. Do Christians ever make an idol out of, out of their entertainment or out of the, the stuff they do, the stuff they have? So many people are searching and chasing and trying to, to fill a God-sized hole in their lives with anything and everything apart from God, who alone can fill it. And it makes us all want to cry out, this life isn't right. It's not the way that it should be, O oh Lord. For such people who mourn over, their, over the sin and evil of this world in such a way, who lament the sin and, and failures of their own lives, considering their sins and accursedness, as we all did in the past week through self-examination, coming to detest ourselves, there is, there is somewhere to turn where such, such ones may find blessings. And that brings us to our second point, seeing what that blessing is. To those who mourn, Christ pronounces a blessing saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, this is what we call a, a paradox. In other words, a paradox is a, is a puzzle not easily explained. How is it that those who mourn can find comfort? What kind of a blessing is this? Well, to start there, to 
call one blessed is to say that they are under God's favor. For him or for him or her who is stretched out in, in longing for the kingdom to come, groaning with creation in eager expectation. For those who lament over their sin and brokenness in all of its different forms, Christ preaches a blessed word of comfort. Though they have sorrow, and though that sorrow is real and, and cannot be ignored or just easily swept aside, yet there's joy, there's confidence, for there is a table. There is a table that Christ has prepared for us to speak to us about his salvation. And this table tells us that Christ came and that he was victorious where every other peace plan or clever compromise had failed, Christ brought peace through his finished work. The cause of our mourning and misery has been dealt with fully and completely when sin was defeated on the cross. And so, Although we, we continue to experience the results and the effects of sin in our lives, we may live in the power of his victory already today. For the table declares to us that Christ's broken body and shed blood have ushered in the kingdom of God. And we, today, enjoy a foretaste just a, a tiny little bit, but yet tangible, real, to hold in our hands, to feel on our lips, to taste, to, to see and to know and believe that God is good. For God has given us the visible sign and seal to point us to the invisible, what is ours by faith alone. Just as sure as Christ laid down his life for the sins of this world, so surely were our sins paid for by his death. By his death we are forgiven. As surely as this food and drink is in our hands and we eat and drink them by faith. This is our comfort. This is our comfort. What's comfort? Comfort is not ease. Comfort is not living without any pain in this world. Comfort is not the, the quality of feeling cozy and, and comfy and comfortable, as we'd say. Not feeling cushy and coddled. No, comfort is having a greater good over against a very great evil. That's what comfort is. Comfort is having a greater good against, over against a very great evil. Comfort is the encouragement that we have that evil has been defeated by the power and the powerful work of God in Jesus Christ in the Gospel. It's Christ who gives us comfort that overcomes our mourning. And so the comfort that we as believers have in the graveyard is, is found in the knowledge of Christ's resurrection, sign of his victory. The comfort we have in the struggle against personal sin that we cannot overcome in our life, the comfort we have in that situation is the blood of Christ shed on the cross, poured out for the complete forgiveness of our sins. Our text this morning says they will be comforted. There's a future tense, a future aspect to this. We already know about our comfort and we already experience it today, but the comfort will be fully realized when Christ returns and shares with us the marriage feast 
of the Lamb and drinks the wine new with us in heaven. And so we are forward-looking people awaiting the, the abundant joy and glory and rejoicing when Christ's victory will be, will be apparent to all and celebrated by all who believe and turn to him for the forgiveness of sins. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, this morning, what are you lamenting? What are you mourning? Our sense before us a type of mourning that is not natural. It's natural to mourn for reasons of self-pity or of personal loss. That's natural. And we ought to grieve those uh, things as well, but it is not natural to lament the brokenness of sin, the oppression of sin, the deception of sin, unless God through His Holy Spirit gives us the eyes of faith to see and to recognize it for what it is. For this promise of comfort is not for those, it's not for those who don't care that sin brings deadly deception and damage and destruction. This comfort is not for those who think it is not a big deal, that this world is, is fractured and hurting all over the place, or that the church's witness suffers from so much division and disagreement, disregard of, of God's Word, or that so many Christians have compromised the truth for the sake of, of winning the world's approval. The promise of comfort and blessing in our text is not for those who don't mourn, but for those who do. The comfort is for those who share the pain that God Himself experiences because of the sin committed against Him. For the scriptures teach us that God grieves over sin. Christ himself mourned at the grave of Lazarus and he wept over Jerusalem for her refusal to turn away from her sins. We are also instructed by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians not to grieve the Holy Spirit, which we do when we live in open sin and shame. The way of blessing is through lamenting over sin. Lamenting over how slow we are to grow up in Christ. Lamenting over how little we love God and how little we love each other and how little we love those who are lost. But the comfort of the Gospel is ours. When we look to Christ, for strength in our weakness, when we look to God's love to reignite our own, and when we look to the cross to compel us, to push us forward, to, to love God, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to love those who are lost and who are perishing, who have no answer for the sorrows of this fallen world. We have Brothers and sisters, we have the only answer, the only comfort. Don't we confess that in Lord's Day 1? The only comfort in Christ. And so by remembering His sacrifice and placing our faith nowhere else, we proclaim His death until He comes. Amen.
Let us now proceed to the administration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And as we prepare ourselves for the celebration, let us read together from the form designated for this purpose, which we can find on page 603 and following in the back of the Book of Praise. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper has been instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of this institution as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. In order that we may now celebrate this holy supper of the Lord to our comfort, we must first rightly examine ourselves. Further, we must use it as Christ intended it, namely, to his remembrance. True self-examination consists of the following three parts. First, let everyone consider his sins and accursedness, so that he, detesting himself, may humble himself before God. For the wrath of God against sin is so great that he could not leave it unpunished, but has punished it in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, by the bitter and shameful death on the cross. Second, let everyone search his heart whether he also believes the sure promise of God that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is freely given him as his own, as if he himself had fulfilled all righteousness. Third, let everyone examine his conscience, whether it is his sincere desire to show true thankfulness to God with his entire life, and laying aside all enmity, hatred, and envy to live with his neighbor in true love and unity. God will certainly receive in grace all who are thus minded and count them worthy to partake of the supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who do not feel this testimony in their hearts eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Therefore, according to the command of Christ and of the Apostle Paul, we admonish all those who know themselves to be guilty of the following offensive sins, to abstain from the table of the Lord, and we declare to them 
that they have no part in the kingdom of Christ. All who refuse to trust in the Lord alone, or who serve him in their own manner, all who abuse the name of the Lord by cursing or in any other way, all who do not diligently attend the worship services, and who despise the proclamation of God's word or the sanctity of the sacraments, all who are disobedient to their parents or to others in authority over them, all who violate human life or cherish hatred against their neighbor and refuse to be reconciled to him, all who either within or outside of holy wedlock do not keep their bodies pure, all who by stealing, greed, or extravagance lead a worldly life, all liars, backbiters, and slanderers, briefly, all who either in word or conduct show themselves to be unbelieving by leading an offensive life. While they persist in their sins, they shall not take of this food which Christ has ordained only for his believers. Otherwise, their judgment and condemnation will be the heavier. But all this, beloved brothers and sisters, is not meant to discourage broken and contrite hearts, as if only those who are without sin may come to the table of the Lord. For we do not come to this supper to declare that we are perfect and righteous in ourselves. On the contrary, we seek our life outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ, and in doing so we acknowledge that we are dead in ourselves. We also are aware of our many sins and shortcomings. We do not have perfect faith and we do not serve God with such zeal as he requires. Daily we have to contend with the weakness of our faith and with the evil desires of our flesh. Yet, by the grace of, of the Holy Spirit, we are heartily sorry for these shortcomings and desire to fight against our unbelief and live according to all the commandments of God. Therefore, we may be fully assured that no sin or weakness which still remains in us against our will can prevent us from being received by God in grace and from being made worthy partakers of this heavenly food and drink. Let us now consider for what purpose the Lord has instituted his supper, namely, that we should use it in remembrance of him. We are to remember him in the following manner. First of all, let us fully trust that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father into this world according to the promises made from the beginning to the fathers in the Old Testament and that he assumed our flesh and blood. From the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life on earth, he bore for us the wrath of God under which we should have perished eternally. By his perfect obedience, he has for us fulfilled all the righteousness of God's law. We remember in particular that the weight of the wrath of God caused by our sins pressed out of him sweat like drops of blood falling on the ground in the garden of Gethsemane. There he was bound that he might free us from our sins. He suffered countless insults that we might never be put to shame. Though innocent, he was condemned to death, that we might be acquitted at the judgment seat of God. He even let his blessed body be nailed to the cross, that he might cancel the bond which stood against us because of our sins. By all this, he has taken our curse upon himself, that he might fill us with his blessing. On the cross, he humbled himself in body and soul to the very deepest shame and anguish of hell. Then he called out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we might be accepted by God and never more be forsaken by him. Finally, by his death and the shedding of his blood, he confirmed the new and eternal covenant, the covenant of grace, when he said, It is finished. In order that we might firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, during his last Passover, instituted the Holy Supper. He gave the bread and the cup to his disciples in remembrance of him. He taught us to understand that as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we are reminded and assured of his hearty love and faithfulness towards us. 
It is a sure pledge that he has given his body and shed his blood for us. Otherwise, we would have suffered eternal death. He nourishes and refreshes our hungry and thirsty souls with his crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life, as certainly as this bread is broken before our eyes and this cup is given to us and we eat and drink in remembrance of him. From this institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we learn that he directs our faith and trust to his perfect sacrifice once offered on the cross. It is the only ground for our salvation. Thereby he has become to our hungry and thirsty souls the true food and drink of life eternal. For by his death he has removed the cause of our eternal hunger and misery, which is sin, and obtained for us the life-giving Spirit. By this Spirit who dwells in Christ as the head and in us as his members, we have true communion with him and share in all his riches, life eternal, righteousness, and glory. By the same Spirit we are also united in true brotherly love as members of one body. For the Apostle Paul says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. As one bread is baked out of many grains and one wine is pressed out of many grapes, so we all, incorporated in Christ by faith, are together one body. For the sake of Christ who so exceedingly loved us first, we shall now love one another and shall show this to one another, not just in words, but also in deeds. Finally, Christ has commanded us to celebrate the Holy Supper until he comes. We receive at his table a foretaste of the abundant joy which he has promised and look forward to the marriage feast of the Lamb when he will drink the wine new with us in the kingdom of his Father. Let us rejoice and give him the glory for the marriage feast of the Lamb is coming. May the Almighty, Heavenly God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ help us in this through his Holy Spirit. Amen. To receive all this, let us now humble ourselves before God and call upon him in true faith. Let us pray. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in this supper we cherish the blessed memory of the bitter death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that we may entrust ourselves more and more to your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that our contrite hearts may be nourished with his true body and blood, yes, with him who is the only heavenly bread, that we may not live in our sins, but Christ in us and we in him. Let us so truly be partakers of the new and everlasting covenant, the everlasting testament, the covenant of grace, that we do not doubt that you will forever be our gracious Father, never more imputing to us our sins, but providing us with all things for body and soul as your dear children and heirs. Grant us your grace that we may take up our cross joyfully, deny ourselves, and confess our Savior. Let us in all tribulation await our Lord Jesus Christ who will come from heaven to change our mortal body to be like his glorious body and take us to himself forever. Hear us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now profess our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed as set to music in hymn one.
Brothers and sisters, in order that we may now be nourished with Christ, the true heavenly bread, we must not cling with our hearts to the outward symbols of bread and wine, but lift our hearts on high in heaven, where Christ, our advocate, is at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us not doubt that we shall be nourished and refreshed in our souls with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit as truly as we receive the holy bread and drink in remembrance of him. We now invite all communicant members and guests in good standing to uh, participate as well with us in the sacrament. And the congregation is notified that at the center of the wine tray is grape juice for those who have requested it. As well, there are wrapped pieces of gluten-free bread also on the tray for the bread for those who have requested it. Let us sing as the table is prepared from hymn 59, all stanzas.
the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take, drink from it, each of you. Remember and believe that the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins.
Let us sing together now from hymn 60, hymn 60 at this table. By Christ Beloved in the Lord, since the Lord has now nourished our souls at his table, let us together praise his holy name. Let everyone say in his heart, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Therefore my heart and my mouth shall proclaim the praise of the Lord from now on and forevermore. Amen. Let us give thanks to God in prayer. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in your boundless mercy you have given us your only begotten Son as our mediator. We praise you that he is the sacrifice for our sins and our food and drink to life eternal. We thank you that you give us a true faith through which we may share in such great benefit. Through your Son, you have instituted the Holy Supper for the strengthening of our faith. We earnestly ask you, faithful God and Father, that by your Holy Spirit, this celebration may lead to our daily increase in true faith and fellowship with Christ, your beloved Son. Gracious God and Father, we thank you for the word of blessing that we could hear this morning, which Christ pronounced for those who mourn. Lord, we pray for the grace we need to mourn what is most important in life as we contemplate the damage and distortion that sin has brought about in your world, which you made to be so good in the very beginning. Lord, will you graciously dry our tears with the drying towel of the gospel of redemption and grant us the comfort promised us in Jesus Christ as it is represented so clearly, so perfectly, so wonderfully in the sacramental meal that we could just enjoy. So, Father, soften all our sorrows and lift us up from all our laments as we look to you to receive the encouragement and edification of your word, which you have fulfilled in the saving work of Jesus Christ. Father, be with us all by your grace as we enter upon a new week we pray that in each of our lives we may show evidence of the hope that is within us, the thankfulness that expresses itself coming from our hearts through actions in practical ways as we live together as your people. Help us all to live as your children, your representatives, your ambassadors in this world who reflect to those around us the beauty and the confidence and the trust of knowing your saving grace. Be with those who are living through difficult times and circumstances and situations. Watch over those who are suffering in various ways, be it with bodily afflictions, experiencing the breakdown of the body through increase of age, through diminishing health, or living with disability. We pray that you will also be with those suffering as a result of the breakdown of relationships between husbands and wives, between parents and children, between siblings or partners in business. Lord, we pray that the brokenness of this world may be healed through the only way possible by looking to Christ who laid down his life so that your people could be set free from the oppression of sin and death and be restored to communion with you, looking forward to the hope of life everlasting. So, Father, fill our hearts with that hope and help us to live in light of Christ's victory over sin and evil, the devil and his whole dominion. Help us to live in a true spirit of Christian 
thanksgiving. So, Father, receive our gifts as we offer them to you in gratitude for what you have so richly done for us. Hear us and bless us. We pray this all in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You are now given an opportunity to bring your offerings of thankfulness to the Lord, to worship Him through the offering of your gifts. And after the offering has been collected, we will sing our closing song, our hymn, from hymn 64, all stanzas.
lift up our hearts and receive the blessing of the Lord and go our ways in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.